Hello all, welcome back to our YouTube channel. This would be my second video on Fiddick Yellow Book 2017. So, first of all a big thank you for all of you who have watched the first video, and for those who joins me for the first time, I'll put the link of the previous video in the description below, so you can watch it. Ok let's jump on to today's video. In the previous video, we discussed about few definitions, so I will continue explaining the remaining definitions in detail, with reference to relevant clauses. We'll start with date of completion. First have a good look at the definition, as it is in the document. As you can see, there are four instances that relate to date of completion. First one is simple. The date stated as date of completion in the taking over certificate or the TOC, issued by the engineer. I hope all of you know what is a TOC. Next, the second instance is, if the last paragraph of sub clause 10.1, taking over the works and sections applies, the date on which the works or section are deemed to have been completed in accordance with the contract. So now we'll have a look at the last paragraph of sub clause 10.1. If the engineer does not issue the taking over certificate or reject the contractor's application within this period of 28 days, and if the conditions described in sub-paragraphs A to D above have been fulfilled, the works or section shall be deemed to have been completed in accordance with the contract on the 14th day after the engineer receives the contractor's notice of application and the taking over certificate shall be deemed to have been issued. I'll explain this a little simpler, if the contractor has applied for a TOC through a notice to the engineer in due course, if the contractor has fulfilled everything required to apply for a TOC, and if the engineer fails to issue a TOC or reject the contractor's application within 28 days of notice of application, and if the contractor has completed the works or section by the 14th day after engineer receives the contractor's notice of application, then that 14th day shall be the date of completion, and a TOC shall be issued. I know there are a lot of unclear areas, so we'll carefully go through this entire Clause 10, Employers Taking Over, for better understanding. Subclause 10.1, Taking Over the Works and Sections. According to this subclause, the employer shall take over the works when all the following objectives are fulfilled. First, when the works have been completed in accordance with the contract except for minor outstanding works and defects, which will not substantially affect the safe use of the works or section for their intended purpose, and be mindful that these outstanding works and defects shall be listed in the TOC and the taken over works or section shall be safe to use until the work is completed, while the outstanding works are carried and until the defects are rectified. Also, the contractor shall carry out and pass all the tests on completion. Here when I say the contractor it includes all the subcontractors as well, because at the end of the day the general contractor or the main contractor is responsible for all the subcontractors. Then, if the engineer has given or is deemed to have given a notice of no objection to the as-built records, submitted under sub-paragraph A of sub-clause 5.6 as-built records, which means the as-built records for the works or section, shall be submitted before the commencement of the tests on completion. Here you have to understand that these as-built records are not the final ones, and it is necessary to update them for any change occurred later. So in simple terms, to hand over the works, the contractor has to submit the as-built records before commencing the tests on completion and get no objection from the engineer. Next, if the engineer has given or is deemed to have given a notice of no objection to the provisional O&M manuals for the works submitted under sub-clause 5.7, Operation and Maintenance Manuals, same as for the as-built records, the contractor has to get a no objection for the provisional O&M manuals. So what do you mean by this provisional? We'll go and see in sub-clause 5.7. It says before commencement of the tests on completion, the contractor shall submit provisional O and M manuals for the works or section. So once again it's similar procedure to the as-built records submission. But there are some important points in the sub-clause that we should look at. If during the tests on completion any error or defect is found in the provisional O and M manuals, the contractor shall promptly rectify the error or defect at the contractor's risk and cost. Before the issue of any taking over certificate under subclause 10.1, taking over the works and sections, the final O and M manuals shall be submitted to the engineer under subclause 5.2.2, review by engineer. 
So according to that, not only the provisional O&M manuals, but also the final O&M manuals, have to be submitted for engineer's review to get the TOC. But it is not mentioned there that a notice of no objection is essential for the final O&M manuals to issue a TOC. Okay. The next requirement is that the contractor has to carry out the training as described under sub-clause 5.5, training. So the contractor has to provide necessary training for the employer's personnel to carry out the operations and maintenance after the taking over by the employer. Mainly training is required for special items such as a generator plant, sewerage treatment plant, an oil tank, etc. If the employer's requirements specify training which is to be carried out before taking over, the works shall not be considered to be completed for the purposes of taking over under subclause 10.1, taking over the works in sections, until this training has been completed in accordance with the employer's requirements. It is the contractor's responsibility to provide qualified and experienced training staff, training facilities and all training materials as necessary and as stated in the employer's requirements. Final requirement for the employer to take over works is pretty straightforward actually, when a TOC for the works have been issued or deemed to have been issued by the engineer. So I hope now you all have a clear understanding on the requirements to be satisfied for the employer to take over the works. Now we'll quickly look at what the engineer shall do when he receives the notice of application for a TOC by the contractor. He has two options, which he has to perform within 28 days, and, we have already discussed what happens if he was unable to do so within that period. First option is to issue the TOC to the contractor, stating the date on which the works or section were completed in accordance with the contract, and listing out the minor outstanding work and defects, which will not substantially affect the safe use of the works or section for their intended purpose. If it is not possible to issue the TOC, then he shall reject the application by giving a notice to the contractor with reasons. This notice shall specify the work required to be done, the defects required to be remedied, and the documents required to be submitted by the contractor to enable the taking over certificate to be issued. So with that, we have concluded the first two instances that relate to the date of completion. Then the next instance is connected to sub-clause 10.2, taking over parts. Under this sub-clause, the employer has the option of taking over and use a part of the works after the engineer issue a TOC for that particular part. However, if the employer uses a part of works before a TOC is issued, then the date the employer first uses that part becomes the date of completion for that part, and the engineer has to immediately issue a TOC. But for this to happen, the contractor shall give a notice to the engineer, identifying such part and describing such use, otherwise the contractor may still be liable for that part. So you should understand that the proper correspondence is vital in construction projects, and it helps a great deal in avoiding the occurrence of disputes. Also, under the sub-clause, if the contractor incurs cost as a result of the employer taking over or using a part, the contractor shall be entitled to a claim, subject to sub-clause 20.2. So now we'll look at the final sub-clause related to date of completion, sub-clause 10.3, interference with tests on completion. According to this sub-clause if the contractor is prevented by the employer's personnel, or by any cause for which the employer is responsible, from carrying out the tests on completion for a period of 14 continuous days or a cumulative of 14 days in multiple periods, then the intended date for the completion of tests on completion becomes the date of completion, and the engineer shall immediately issue a taking over certificate for the works or section. Here also, the contractor shall give a notice to the engineer describing such prevention, the same way as the previous sub-clause which we discussed. If the contractor suffers delay or incurs cost as a result of being prevented from carrying out the tests on completion, the contractor shall be entitled for a claim, subject to sub-clause 20.2. Since this sub-clause is directly connected to tests on completion, we'll have a look at the relevant clause. According to sub-clause 9.1, the contractor shall submit as-built records and operation and maintenance manuals before commencing the tests on completion. Also, the contractor shall submit a detailed test program 42 days before the planned start date for tests on completion and get a no-objection notice from the engineer to commence tests on completion. Further, the contractor has to notify the engineer 21 days before the date which the contractor is ready to carry out each of the tests on completion. So, to apply sub-clause 
First you have to check whether the procedure stated in Clause 9 has been followed or not. OK, now we have completed everything related to date of completion as well as taking over the works. If you are a contractor's personnel, it is very important to have thorough understanding on Clause 10 since sub-Clause 10.1, 10.2 and 10.3 can be used very effectively to protect the contractor from unnecessary delays and losses. So that would be the end of today's video. Hope you have gathered some knowledge from this video, and I request all of you watching to go through FIDIC Yellow Book 2017. Don't forget to thumbs up the video and comment your thoughts and questions below. Finally subscribe my channel for more videos like this. Thank you very much for watching this video and take care until next time.